Thank you for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast, where we discuss design, innovation, and all things concrete. <laughs> so who wants to go first? Do you want to go Good first? Good morning, everybody. Go? Welcome back. Yes. Uh, welcome to the Maker in the Mix. Um, excited to... Excited to have episode 23 going on. Uh, we're going to do a little bit different uh, today. Yes, we're going to um, get organized. <laughs> yes, we are. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and give you our talking points. That way you can know what to expect. And then I'm going to try really hard um, to actually move us along because I found this little feature in here. I can mark clips. Um, and so you can actually have the different segments of, of the discussion, um, marked as chapters on YouTube. I'm not sure how that works on Spotify, so I'll dig into that, but, um, we are going to call this episode, the fine balance, fiber types, fluidity, and flexural strength in concrete. So, yes. um, yeah. So you're not going to so, let me talk for an hour and a half on fibers. I mean, <laughs> Maybe, but maybe not. Uh, <laughs> I'll try not to. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the the trend right now of having uh, ultra flowable concrete. Mm -hmm. um, there's a an industry desire, and I'm not sure necessarily whether or not this reflects the customer's desire. Um, so that's maybe a different discussion. But there's a, a trend right now. You know, we want to make quote unquote perfect concrete if that makes sense um you know so no pinholes i don't want to have to grout anything ever um and what we're discovering in our testing is that that might be a trade off so we're going to talk about that um the the trend and and, and the appeal versus the you know upside downside that kind of thing um and then we're going to talk about the trade off so that's number 2 um, between fluid concrete and flexural strength, because there's certain things you have to do to get to fluid concrete, um, that will give you that kind of surface quality after, you know, casting and flipping. Um, and there may be a trade off there. Um, and then we're going to talk as uh, about strength as in our mind, a non-negotiable factor. Um, so the, the importance of flexural strength, particularly with regard to moving pieces, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, those, that's for those of us who are precast, of course, if you're doing, uh, cast in place, this is a, a slightly different discussion, but I do think it's very important. Um, we're going to talk about the different kinds of fibers. So that's number four, um, PVA versus AR glass. Those are the two commonly used, um, fiber reinforcement, uh, avenues. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about alpha. Um, so we've just been blown away by the strength that we're getting and we're really excited about it and want you to join us in that excitement, mm -hmm. of course. So, um, and we're going to talk, number six is the magic dose fiber and fluidizer. So we're going to talk about different dosages, of uh, fiber and, um, your super plasticizer, um, how that might affect your strength. Um, we're going to talk about what we've done to give you the best of both worlds to the best of concrete's ability. Um, so, you know, we've been able to achieve really, really great flow ability and really, really great strength. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then there, if, if there's anybody on at the time when we get to that, um, cause you know, as you may know, we do record this live. Um, but we also recorded at seven 30 in the morning, Eastern standard time. So that may not work for everybody, but we do want to open that up for discussion. Uh, so, um, and then, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So, yeah. so let's start with, uh, so I'm going to mark that introduction to the fluid concrete trend. Yeah, I mean, this is this is an interesting point because it's it makes a lot of sense from a, a production standpoint. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, so I was thinking about this and kind of waxing nostalgic. Looking back on the, the, the my history of doing this, uh, where I got started and and all the, the different paths I've taken. And I've looked at like at the time, my contemporaries. Um, Sonoma Castone, 
uh, Concrete Work Studio. Certainly, the, the the man that I credit all my inspiration from, Buddy Rhodes, um, and and certainly Fu Tong Cheng, who I was not directly aware of until I I met him in two thousand and one. Um, and, and a number of other people, uh, Soup Can, Concrete Works Studio, Concrete Jungle, uh, Dex, um, some of the big fabricators who, some of which are retired now and not, not, not present and other ones who, who are still have a, a large presence. And what's interesting is, uh, the big producers, the truly successful people, uh, don't care about social media. Uh, they're it's not. True you know, dabbling in the little dramas that go on or the, the, you know, the, the fashionable politics that, that, that bubble up now and then, or continue well, they're doing their own thing and making money. Yeah, and they're doing their own know. thing and, and they have their own vision and they don't really, you know, they're, they're, listen, they're, they're satisfying their, their customers and that's what matters. Yeah. Right. So, and I think that's at the heart of it is what do your customers want? What is, what is your market want? And we, as craftspeople, what does your market want is a great question. It really, yeah. really is. It, it, it behooves you to understand who your clients are and respond. It, it's, a, it's a fluid, flexible, plastic relationship, right? Um, it's kind of a chicken in the egg. I like to make certain things. I like to, let, let, just hypothetically, let's say I like, I love terrazzo. Right. And I love really busy terrazzo with lots of different colors of things in it. And that's just that that's that's what floats my boat. Right. And I could have dozens and dozens and dozens of beautiful formulations and have worked out great ways to do it efficiently, which is not easy. But if nobody in my market area wants it, then Doesn't what matter. am I doing this for? On the other hand, let's say your market does want it and you don't know how to do it, right? You don't know how to do that look, but people come to you, keep coming to you and asking for it. You know, hey, can you do this? And it, they show you pictures of Terrazzo. In our, in our, a couple episodes ago, we said, hey, give us a call that will help you figure out. That's what we mean. Like, mm -hmm. how do you do Terrazzo effectively? Like, are there, is there only one way? Are there many different ways? That's what we meant, right? And so you need to understand it's not just, you're not making stuff for you personally right. only. Now, as there, there are different, there's a spectrum of, of like fabricator. There's like the, the pure fabricator who's like, okay, I don't care what I make. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care who it's for. I get an order. I fabricate it. I ship it out. I do it. And that's that's a powerful business model, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's at one end of the spectrum. Somewhere in, in that spectrum, there's a as, there's another point where you come up with your own designs, right? I've got a chair, a sink, a planter, a bathtub, a whatever, right? And you pick the colors, you pick the finish, you pick the shape, you pick the style, and you make these things. You have production molds, and you boom. You, you make these things. You make these mm -hmm. widgets. And today we're casting uh, mold A. And mold A, we're going to do five in blue and five in gray and five in white. And they go up on the shelf and they go out to distributors and they go out to showrooms, et cetera. That's another model. And then there's at another end of the spectrum, there's this sort of like the pure artist where what you make is entirely your vision and you're just creating something like Picasso would make, would paint a painting. He didn't paint it for anybody. He just he painted, painted it. it. That came from his, his mind, his heart, his soul. He just painted something. Right. And then the world responded to it. Like, so that in my personal opinion, that's like the definition of art. You're, you're creating something as an expression of, you it's not for anybody it's not commissioned it's not like a portrait where you're painting the portrait of you know king charles the umpteenth you're paint or somebody's dog you're just creating something right so right. that's so... another legitimate direction <clears throat> what concrete you're doing the style 
am I making a very stiff clay-like hand pack finish? Am I making a terrazzo that I have to grind and expose aggregate? Am I doing a high spray where I'm taking my, my hopper gun and I'm varying the height over the mold and spattering and maybe I'm changing the color or the pigment dose or maybe I'm troweling the concrete because I'm pouring it and doing um, instead of casting inverted and casting right side up and I'm troweling that surface like you would do a floor or am I um, marbling it using you know using the old school cast stone process of using baking soda to create sort of a stone like texture that's you know that's old school cast stone like ben stuff. Ben Ashby, that, you know, kind of yeah, Ben Ashby, methods. those those kind of folks who have manipulated probably using you know color hardener as sort of that dusting to give the veins in it. Um, that's this is a spectrum of concrete as a material is super manipulatable. It's a chameleon. You can you can take a similar kind of mix or or what I like. The reason why I like GFRC is you can take that one mix. You don't have to change anything about it other than its consistency and how you cast it, how you manipulate it, you get different looks. And that lets you respond, you know, this, you can fit your market better. Yeah. Now, from a production standpoint, the most efficient way of making concrete is you've got a mold. I got a bucket in my coffee cup, right? But I got a bucket and I take concrete that is as liquid as possible is my bucket i'm going to use this you can see through it and i pour that liquid concrete into the bucket into the mold it doesn't take long and if i jig a little little it helps release the air because that's the key is you do a little bit of agitation knocks the air bubbles off the surface and they they come out of the, they move away from the surface and within a few minutes i fill the mold and I'm done. It's ultra efficient. It's the most efficient way of doing production. So when you see companies that produce products, a uh, good example, it's an old book I got from when I visited some Sonoma Castone 2005 or six, right? This is, this was their, this was their little catalog. Kind of cool, right? All these are made. These are wet casts. They're not GFRC, by the way, because it really wasn't popular back then. Um, wet cast or what we would call SCC or direct cast. Direct cast really refers to like a GFRC technique, but mm -hmm. we we'll just vaguely use, you may have a very fluid concrete that you pour into a mold. And then when you kind of agitate a little bit, when you demold that piece, the surface is a very high quality surface, either has minor pinholes, or if you're lucky, no pinholes, and very little processing is done to it. and aside from maybe removing some flash and grinding the, the, the top free cast surface to get it flat, boom, you're done, right? It goes, moves on to the next process. Very, very efficient. That, it ha that, that offers some challenges because you have to have a very specific mix and very specific setup to be able to do that consistently, right? And mm -hmm. that produces pretty much a singular look. Right. Now, maybe that's what your customers want. This is getting at the heart of what you're saying. So I, I took a little path that comes back to that is, what if your market doesn't really care about that? Well, I mean, one thing that we've talked about in the past, Jeff, is that, um, you know, that singular look, if you're making, you know, a solid color. So, you know, if you're making something like a marbled, like, you know, my marbling technique, I use casting powder, you know, baking soda, that kind of thing, like you know, similar to ben the Ben Ashby method, but different, you know, achieved aesthetic, right? But when you use a casting powder like that, a color hardener or just a baking soda or whatever, you're going to get pinholes no matter how fluid your concrete is. You could have the most fluid concrete in the world, but you use that casting powder, there's going to be grout. Has to be. Yep. And that's part of the aesthetic. And so, you know, I've I've gotten to the point where, like, I was doing a, a, a concrete, uh, coffee table for a customer a client in Detroit um, recently. And I did my casting method, you know, I created some veining and then I put an inner in and I, I cast it flowable. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of did a both and. Um, and so, yeah, I got relatively few pinholes on, I mean, almost none really. I, I, 
we used it in class. My uh, shop manager, Jay, who is a genius, uh, built like this little concrete uh, funnel out of melamine that he sat in the form. And we just dumped into there and used a vibrator yeah. and, you know, did not underestimate hydrostatic pressure because, you know, all of that. So, um, and so my cast surface, other than where I had used the powder, was immaculate. Yeah. Um, but that like when we did that big table in Legends, you know, yeah. that was like, I don't know, 60 my it was like 58 square feet of, of panel that we, we poured, did direct cast. And yeah, we moved it around with trowels and things like that just to spread it because we had to lay down a really thin layer. But it was bas basically pinhole free, mm -hmm. you know, virtually now, pinhole free. Yeah, I mean, now on the edges, because we didn't slap it up the sides or whatever like I normally yeah. do, you know, we kind of we went left... for a slightly over segregated, you know, layer. It's an look. industrial look. We, we, we made that conscious aesthetic decision to leave it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I think so this is a... where there's a both and on that piece as well. And I think, you know, learning where that aesthetic design, you know, I mean, most of my customers, my clients want concrete, you know, they, they come to me because they want the aesthetic of the material, but perhaps in an elevated way. So I'll give mm -hmm. you a, an example, and then we'll move on to the next, next topic here uh, after we kind of back and forth on this for a minute. But there's a restaurant here in Asheville called Cultura. It's next to Wicked Weed Funkatorium, which is one of my favorite breweries. Um, and they have this thing going for the last like year and a half. They've been doing this thing called, um, I think it's called Cease and Desist, which is pretty funny. Uh, but they're they're taking menu items from popular American chain restaurants and elevating them. And so nice. they they had like I mean, chicken done, nuggets. <laughs> yeah, honest to God, they they've done Taco Bell, they've done Outback Steakhouse, they've done Chili's, they did Pizza Hut, they've done. I mean, it's hilarious to me, and I cannot wait to go. I'm I've been watching the menu, waiting for one that I really want to go to. I missed out on Outback. I would have been stoked to go to that one and Taco Bell. They had a Baja Blast cocktail. So I mean, wow, how can you go wrong? But um, point being, you know, they're taking a thing that people like and they're elevating it, right? So what what we're doing is we're taking a thing that people like, concrete, you know, and and elevating it and giving them more than they thought possible. But a lot mm -hmm. of times to me that includes some of the visual um movement. Absolutely. That we you know come to expect from concrete because at some level concrete does what it wants to do. Um and that's what, you know, some artisans who I admire greatly are, you know, I think of like a, certainly a Ben Ashby from, from way back. Um, you know, I, I think of like a Dusty Baker. I love his look. He's killed that, that game. And, and there are elements, you know, of those aesthetics that require additional work post-processing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, like Dusty's clients, for inst instance, like they go after that look for, you know, for him and he's yeah. gotten very popular and he's teaching that method. And that's awesome. I love that. Um, and, you know, similarly, my marbling technique, similar concept, different outcome, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's going to be some visual, a lot of visual movement. Now there's certainly a way to get solid, you know, like I did my sister's countertops and she just wanted solid black. Right. Yeah. It is an extremely consistent, solid black countertop. It's beautiful, but not every client's going to want exactly that one thing. So you kind of have to diversify. So if all you know how to do is make uber fluid concrete and make it have zero pinholes, like that's a great achievement. But it's a one you know, trick pony. It's a one trick pony, exactly. So um, you know, I think kind of like our our sealer discussion from a few weeks ago about offering more than one option for your clients you know do you want a uh, relatively maintenance free surface or do you want patina i think it's important that you be capable of offering both in the same vein i think it's important that you be capable of you know offering a beautiful cast quality um you know as well as as a visual movement quality now one thing that i will caution is if you're doing, if all you're able to do is solid color, wet cast with no pinholes, that's kind of mimicking 
some lower grade materials. Corian, for instance. You know, right. So just, you know, I, I think people want authentic concrete and I think we need to be willing, you know, we, we've talked a lot about materials and the willingness to, to expend a little bit more on a quality material, which is a super important thing. But I think you ought to be willing to expend a, su a little bit extra time as well to give your clients the, the, the real deal, right? I'm going to take a little side path here. And I think there's a really important point because I've seen this over the years. I've been doing this for a long, long time, long time. And there's a there's a trend that I've seen, and it's kind of disturbing, but it's understandable too. And like in other in other businesses or hobbies, especially, there's always folks looking for shortcuts, right? Um, if you want something done really well, if you want something very high quality, if you want something exceptional, there are no shortcuts, right? And part of running a successful business because if you are serious about this if you are doing this to earn money to support your family to support your employees you are running a business and that comes first mm -hmm. and of course you need to make smart business decisions about you know do i do do i buy a a blended mix do i buy a a premix admix pack do i do totally from scratch you know there's a lot of it depends type factors. One of the biggest ways, one of the greatest ways to, you know, prevent, to, to maintain your profit margin is not to make mistakes. And another way is to not have failures or anything unanticipated. Mistakes are things that, that you could have controlled, but you didn't. And it came back to bite you. Yeah. Um, problems like a piece cracking is certainly catastrophic especially if it happens, you know, while you're installing a piece. That's mm -hmm. devastating because it Which, has such a man has a, such ram, huge ramifications. It, this ties into the strength thing. But Well, and that, and that, that's what I was going to say is yeah. that's actually a fantastic segue and I want you right. to keep talking, but that's a great segue and I'm going to mark this clip as well. Um so this is my chapter marker. But um <laughs> <laughs> we need to get one of those. I, know, I need one now. I'm going to order it. Um <laughs> You know, but this is so this is a great segue into number two, which is yeah. the trade off. Right. And so we're going to talk a little bit here about the trade off between that mm -hmm. very consistent aesthetic that a lot of people, a lot of artisans are trying to achieve um, and maintaining your flexural strength. So sure. clip marker. So like the, the one thing that really appealed to me about GFRC when I first started le learning about it was it did something that prior to that when, with. You know, I did a stiff hand pack, not necessarily Buddy Rose where he did his press technique. I call it hand pack where you just have a stiff concrete and you're packing it like a pie crust, dense, and the voids are irregular, small, organic shaped, um, non-predictable. They're not connected. Um, but it, when you backfill them with grout, it does have a very stone-like character to it. And because it was steel reinforced concrete you basically fill the mold full right you're basically casting things like inch and a half or thicker solid the the thing that really appealed to me about gfrc was you were because it has a face coat and then a backer layer you, it was more similar to like in woodworking where you have a veneer so you have your expense because i used to do veneering um you know, I built, like I mentioned in the past, I built speakers and things like that. And I, I, I had to learn how to do woodworking, how to learn how to do veneering because I wanted to do these things. I had beautiful African sapele uh, veneer and I had co wood veneer, uh, which is really beautiful wood. Um, but the main structure was a different material because, you know, it'd be horrendously expensive to make something out of solid koa. You can barely buy that anymore. And it wouldn't be the right material because of its sonic properties, its dense properties, et cetera, et cetera. I want to go into that. The cool thing about GFRC was you were able to separate the, the visual port part, whether it was sprayed or poured or hand placed or hand packed or trowel or whatever from the structural part, the mm -hmm. backer, right? With the backer. And there's still a lot of advantages of that. When you're doing something like direct casting or in the old school wet cast where you're pouring in your concrete mix, 
it's all one, right? So the look you're achieving on the surface should not affect the structural characteristics of what's behind it. Exactly. And vice versa, you should not change your mix if you're doing like a direct cast mix. You should not change your mix so that the surface characteristics are what's important because right. you could be inadvertently sacrificing strength. So, yeah. So we've been, and I say we, the, the Royal, we, I mean, Jeff, Me. uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've been doing some testing on, you know, different fiber doses, certainly different fiber types, which we'll get into a little bit. Um, and what we found is that, you know, 3% fibers, um, which Jeff can get into specifics of how you actually dose that, but it's, it's somewhat convoluted and, and the CCI calculators take all of that into account. Um, but you know, whereas every other ingredient is dosed based on cementitious content only and, and percentage of weight thereby, um, fibers are dosed by total batch weight, including the fibers, yeah. which is weird. But, um, but all of that's included in the CCI calculator. So I personally don't worry about it because that's the calculator I use. And and one thing that I've noticed um, a lot of people doing is they have just like a standard batch and it's like 9.1 pounds of X and 85 grams of X. And it's like one thing. But to me, that's not, you know, to me, that's not quite precise enough. I, I, I get into the weeds a little bit on the preciseness of my mixed designs. Um, because if you don't know, you know, for instance, is your cementitious to sand? Is it actually 50, 50? Is it, you know, a different ratio, but are you dosing based on 50, 50? I talked to an artisan one time who was like, well, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's a little bit less than 50, 50, but I'm going with it based on 50, 50. And I'm like, actually, hang on. And so he was a CCI alumni. And so, I tweaked the CCI calculator to give him an accurate representation of what his mix design was actually doing um, because I think that's really important. Regardless, um, what we found is that, you know, 3% is kind of the prototypical dose, right, of... of well, that's derived we... from in commercial, commercial. GFRC. There's, there's two flavors. There's like commercial spray up where they have the the chopper guns at spray and that's where you can that's large building panels are done this way so you the the advantage of that is you can spray a higher a larger dose of fibers right you don't have to mix them in because they're mixed on the surface and you can you can spray longer fibers one inch you can tweak two the inch chop long gun. fibers because they're chopped sprayed dry so you have a mist coat and a and a fiber stream coming and they blend on the surface and it takes an incredible amount of skill and and tweaking of the gun and measuring and monitoring of that to make sure you're doing it right but from that you can get very very high volume fractions the other is premix so that's what everybody does is premix where you actually mix your fibers into everybody the in our in our niche in, in our the craft in the, in concrete industry, industry whether you spray it through a a, a spray you know, a pump sprayer like you have um or you're hand laying up by hand or you're adding super plasticizer and direct casting and pouring it like most of us do, right? Yep. So the 3% is kind of, that's where it comes from. And that yeah. means, so 3% means three kilos of fibers added to 97 kilos of mist coat or face coat, right? Has everything in it, including the water. That makes 100 kilos of backer. That's what 3% fibers. It's not based on dry weight. It's waste because that would be uh, underestimating. Right. The amount. It's based so, on total, total weight. So what you're getting at is it's very important to A, know what you're, know yeah. what you're mixing and how you're doing it and B, you know, to weigh it properly. So uh, in our testing, you know, we started out, of course, doing a 3% because that's what we've done for years. It's what's traditional. And in the quest for a you know a, a better surface quality, because you know as we like nineteen millimeter fibers, um, AR glass fibers, and so we're trying to you know create that surface quality while also achieving exceptional strength. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done that. Um, 
you know, and again, by we, I mean, Jeff, um, but, you know, we've kind of come down to a two and a half percent fiber loading, which I found great success with. And the strength is there, um, you know, so am I going to get one or two or ten pen holes? Maybe um, I've had it both ways. I've had, you know, pieces come out with zero. Uh, in fact, I've got some pieces in the shop that I cast. Um, Thursday. Uh, and they're going out tomorrow. Um, but I'm going I'm to interject here. Sure. There are other factors that are more dominant than simply how many fibers. Certainly there's a threshold and we'll come back to that. But let's talk about things like what's the shape of the piece you're making? Are you making sure. a big flat panel or a tall, deep something or other? Right. Um, What's the full form material made out of? Is it rough like melamine or is it smooth like plexiglass? Uh, do you have a form release agent on it or not? Um, are you just pouring it statically or are you tapping it with a hammer and, and or vibrating it? Um, I saw uh, uh, somebody in this industry posted a, a couple pictures in, and he had made this table base that had some inverted curves in it. and the first time he cast it he just poured it and had pinholes in it and then he said well i, I had to do it again because i didn't like the, the pinholes in it and when i tapped the mold with a rubber mallet the pinholes released well there you go so it's not you can't just rely on a mix right. or a concrete mix design or a particular fiber load or a particular admixture to do all the work for you Right, you have to understand. You have to understand what what is the interaction going on. What do you have to do? Like maybe you have to do a little extra work to make sure things look really good. Even then, it's still concrete. That's like it comes back to the the authenticity of this material. Why people like it is, it's got an organic, natural, unpredictability to it. Just right. like hey, I like I like walnut I, as a wood as a wood species. I like walnut. Have you ever seen two pieces of furniture made out of wal walnut that look identical or that maybe that big plank of walnut that you got has a knot in it or that grain does something different? Right. Or there's a stain in it. That's the natural beauty of the material, which draws people to it. So that comes back to understanding your market. Like, does your market want something that looks like shiny white plastic? Right. If they do. Okay, that's A, going to be hard to do, and B, maybe you should start making things out of plastic because that's what they want. Right. Um, well, and, and so to, to kind of bring it back in, you know, I believe, and I know Jeff believes that strength, particularly uh, flexural strength, is something that is non-negotiable. You, right. you know, I as an artisan need not just want, I need flexural strength because I've got to move these pieces. You know, I'm a precast artisan, mm -hmm. so everything I do has to go somewhere. And if I can't flip it or install it safely without it cracking or breaking, then I, it doesn't really matter what it looks like because it won't work. Um, it, and so, you know, for instance, I had a, a 22 foot single piece fireplace hearth. It was L shaped, 35 mm -hmm. inches deep with a 60 inch return or something ridiculous like that and i mean it, i had to drive it two hours away mm -hmm. and have it actually get into place so you know being able to do that in a way that is successful and and achievable with no cracking and no breakage and a happy client the first time is where you know engineering comes in and where you know that was that was jeff helping me figure out how the heck, heck to make this thing um, in a way that was safe. And so, you know, I believe that you can achieve 98% of the aesthetic you want if that happens to be a solid pinhole free esque look while also achieving a safe level of strength. Now, you know, there are that's a couple the, of that, that's really that's, the advantage that CCI brings, and only CCI can do this because I'm the only engineer, the real one, who's teaching this who's teaching this is the aesthetic that you want to do, regardless of what it is, is critically important to your customer because that's yes. all they care about. 
immediately. But what you ought to care about Most is getting it into I better, their house. I better, I better be able to give the customer, like if they want pure white, beautiful, near flawless, okay, it's hard to do, so it's going to be expensive, but I need to know how to do that, right? No excuses there. But let's say you do that and then you flip it off the table and it breaks into five pieces. Right. It doesn't matter how pretty the piece is if it doesn't survive. The first stress is demolding. The second mm -hmm. stress is, you know, flipping it over, moving it around your shop to get ready for processing. Maybe you're going to hone it. Maybe you're going to leave it. Maybe you're going to do a light, a light sanding or an acid wash on it and then seal it. If it can't survive that, like when it's, ba when it's a baby. Remember, we are working on these pieces when they're brand new. Like I do, I've done lots of one day tests, 24 well, hour tests. That's why we do one day tests. That's why we do one day to, tests because know. if I only did seven day tests, sure, I get great numbers and that's more realistic to when the piece is probably going to be installed. But it who sits, who lets a piece sit in the mold for seven days? That's just unrealistic. Nobody, I never did that even when I was doing old school concrete 20 right. years ago. Right. It was in the mold two days, maybe three at most if I was unsure, but not seven days. Right. So, and so what, that's, that's the most, excuse me, regardless of your desired finish, yeah. your strength ought never to be compromised. And I think, you know, I think something that's really, uh, worthwhile to talk about, and we'll get into some of this with the PVA versus AR glass, is that people, artisans, don't actually know that they are compromising their strength right. because they're not being informed on what these ingredients are doing or not doing. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Um, and so, you know, when when it's like, well, just drop your fibers to, you know, yeah. less than 2% because that'll or give you better add a, flow. Add a, add or more plasticizer. Um, right. And, and that's something that we've realized over the t the course of testing is that, you know, say above like a, a 0.7 uh, percent uh, plasticizer. And it seems to be irrespective of which plasticizer, because we've had we've done this with uh, a number of different plasticizers. Yeah, like right. Five, 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 for example, or, or some other ones or, on the market you know, or some BASF products or. um yeah, liquids, I mean, dry, the whole whatever. nine. You when get you over a point seven ish, you know, well, up to, that up point to seven one. for dry, right? Um, with liquids, because liquids are so less powerful, like they're diluted. literally diluted. You, you know, you're talking probably above a one, one and a half percent. We'll call it above a one percent easily. You can really start to significantly affect, and it has to do with the chemistry, the way polycarboxylates work is. Because it's it's a literally it's a kind of polymer, right? So when people say, "Oh, I don't like polymer," well, your super plasticizer is a polymer, folks. It's a different mm -hmm. kind of polymer, so don't get triggered by the word polymer. Um, it literally wraps around the cement particles and your pozzolans and your pigments and all other ultra fine materials, right? And depending on the the chemistry of it, it there's uh, it's it's pretty cool. There, you can look this up on BAS of website. And the the actual polymer looks like if you took a feather and you split it down the length. So you got the spine of the feather and then you got little fronds, whatever they're called. I don't know what feather, the little things. Sounds the right feather, to me. Right. Well, the backbone of that polymer, they tailor its length and how sticky it is. Sticky, electrostatically sticky. And that comes and fine is attracted to a cement particle. And then it wraps around it. And then the little fronds stick up. And depending on how they can tailor how long those fronds are. So that that's you get electrostatic and electrosteric steric repulsions where you actually have physical these little frond thingies hmm. keeping it away. Right. And if you as you add more super plasticizer, more and more of those particles, those polymer strands coat the cement particles. And there's a point where I don't want to, this is just hypothetically theoretical kind of hand waving. You coat it so much, water can't get to the cement particle. And so it actually starts to retard the hydration of the, of the cement particle. Right. So your strength gain is affected. And when you start to 
really you have to use a lot of superplasticizer, especially a weaker superplasticizer where you have to be up near a 1% dose or even higher. Um, you're just like saturating everything with this stuff. And so there's a ton of this material kind of getting in the way. Right. Um, and that will really affect your early strengths. Now, it might not affect the long-term strength. It might not it might not have any effect on the 28-day strength. It may not even have a measurable, measurable effect on the seven-day strength. But again, you got to flip it. It will piece. have an effect on your one-day strength. And that's when you demold it. Mm-hmm. The very first time I... I got a sample of a polycarboxylate. Um, our uh, chemical rep from BASF came. This was way back in like 2007 or something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I got three different samples of Melflux. Melflux 2641, 2651, and 1641. They're, they don't even make them. They have new versions now. It's like I think the new one's like 4950 or something like that. It's sort of like a, a darker yellow color powdered superplasticizer. It's a pretty good one, right? But it's one of the ones I looked at and rejected because fluidizer is better than that. Um, I happened to get these in, in the winter and my shop was cold. Like it's January, so my shop, ambient shop temperatures were hovering in the 50s. And I made a sample out of the 1641, which I learned was kind of optimized for summer use because it had a retarding effect. It did not have a retarder in it. It just had a retarding effect on the concrete. So that sample that I made, I could still stick my finger in it the next day. Like I could push my finger through it. It was still workable the next day. Now it eventually hardened into something incredibly strong, but the next day, like I would want to demold it, it was still, it was not a solid yet. So using the wrong superplasticizer or using a superplasticizer at a very high dose to achieve those high workabilities can affect your strength. And if you're wondering why, maybe you're having, uh, maybe you're having like surface crazing or cracking issues, or maybe you're seeing, you know, pieces crack unexpectedly or maybe because the concrete feels a little soft when you do that it's probably because you're using too much super plasticizer or you're using the wrong super plasticizer because it's not strong enough to get the kind of workability you want so well, but i i would add be really to, though i want to interject here th- yeah absolutely i want to interject though that um you know certainly there are <laughs> excuse me um you know, mixes out there that feel very hard um, to the touch. Yeah, hardness uh, is not strength. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Nor is and, density. And, and so I just want to, you know, really flexural strength is flexural strength. There isn't a substitute. There isn't a way that you can wrap your wrap, wrap your knuckles on it and know, oh, this is strong. It may be dense and it may be hard, but it may not be flexurally strong. Yeah, and so... Brittle. Exactly. And that's something that, you know, when we have pulled back our dosing of fibers below, say, 2%, maybe one three quarter or something, um, and we've upped our plasticizer fluidizer to get to a point where, you know, we're getting, a you know, a large uh, amount of, of spread, um, your your quality is fantastic, but your strength is compromised. And so, you know, I think on some level you're going to have to, and, and like I said, we can get 98% with the strength that we feel is, is acceptably safe. Um, and so, you know, I think the argument that you should spend a little bit more on your materials to, you know, better, better materials, make better concrete. Absolutely. I yeah. also think you need to be paying attention pretty, pretty pointed attention to your strengths and, you know, what you're doing to achieve those flowability numbers so that, you know, you can really decide is, is this lack of strength, is this risk of damage, risk of breakage, is it worth, you know, the one or two pinholes that I might find and have to fill, right? Because in my personal shop, I am going to pick 
one, two, or 10. I don't want it full of pinholes, right? And nobody does. I don't want to have to grout three times. I would like to grout once and, and be we done. Have, we know how to do that. Like we, we have a technique that and, 95% and the reality of the is, time you, you nail it the first time with one and, grout. Yeah. And the reality is grouting, even on a larger project is, you know, with the method that we have is an hour, you know? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're, and so you're kind of starting to split hairs too, because you're also, if you're doing a wet cast technique with GFRC, you also have to spend an extra three, four hours building an inner mold. So you're, you're already expending extra time to do something. So if you're going to do that, you ought to really know that you can rely on your strength and you ought to be willing to spend one extra hour do filling a pinhole or two because, you know, you've chosen to get the extra strength, you know, the, you're again, 98% there. So if, if you had a hundred pinholes in a previous mixed design with a liquid polymer or something, and you can get to zero, but you might break the piece, why not go to 98 and not break the piece and fill two pinholes? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's the, that's the not cutting corners part. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to back off on my fibers because fibers inhibit flow. Um, I'm going to crank the super plasticizer because that increases the flow. Um, sure, I get a great casting. It looks beautiful. But does it break? I, I don't have to do any work. Like, that's all important. But maybe I got a 50 50 ch chance of this piece breaking at well, some point. Well, maybe it's 75 25, but that's still unacceptable yeah. to me. It, it, yeah, it's what's the cost of having to redo a piece? I mean, let, let's let's take a moment to think about that. It's not it's not just oh, I gotta I gotta cast it again. Well, all the form, form work that you built probably needs to be redone. So that's all that material, all that time, all that space, plus the material the the materials, right? Well, and think if you have employees, that's their time, their your labor time. that you got to pay for. Or if it's and, your time, that's time right, you're not spending on a new project. In a production shop. You know, we're not just doing this one piece at a time in a garage now and then. It's in a production shop. You got other. You got a queue of of projects, right? So I cast this project today. I do mold it tomorrow, and it's on a schedule. The space that at that project occupied needs to be occupied by another paying customer. Absolutely. So I, I mean, in my piece. shop right now, I've got fourteen projects. Yeah. Right, and they keep rolling in, and you know. So I used to do I've, eight, 12 projects constantly. Yeah. And so you've got to cool. be able to be efficient. You got to roll those projects out. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so I think that the surface quality argument is totally valid. You want that because that cuts down on a bottleneck uh, to some degree, because if you're grouting three, four, five times, totally. Now, one thing I will mention is that if, if you can, you know, let's say for instance, because I hone all of my pieces, I have a Corian table. Um, and so there are some scratches in it and it's, it's dead flat and dead level and all of that, but there are some scratches in it. And so a simple acid etch is not going to get all of the texture out. So I have to hone. That's a choice I've made for a reusable casting surface. Right. Um, so I hone it 200 grit start finish, right? I cast on steel. I mean, I was casting on steel. Or epoxy. 20 years or ago. Whatever. 20 yeah. years ago, I was casting on steel. Same thing. You got to hone the surface. Got to. And so, you know, I've chosen that. That's a step I've chosen because mm -hmm. I've tried. I have tried to just acid etch it, and I just am not happy with the, the marks from the table that still appear. And so I process at 200 grit, wet, you know, wet on, my, uh, on my planetary polisher. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, I may only have to grout the edge. I may only have to, you know, but it's good practice. If you're going to grout any of your piece, grout all of it because you don't want staining and things like that. And, and so, but the way that we do it is we grout and we leave an, an, a tiny, tiny, tiny film. You know, we use foam as squeegees and we go through all of this. At, at class. Haze. So, yeah. you know, part, that's certainly part of it. Right. Um, but we leave a, a very thin film or a thin haze and we use like a 220 or 320 wet dry sandpaper to take it off by hand. So 
that the couple of advantages there, A, you're not opening up new pinholes by reprocessing because that's what actually is happening when you, you know, when you have to go out three, four, five times because you filled one or two pinholes and then you process and, oh, shoot, there's another two or three pinholes. You overcut you it and then you open you're, up You're more. cutting into new pin. You're not actually taking grout of old pinhole, out of old pinholes. You are create. you're revealing new ones. And so if you can avoid that step of extra processing or use a higher grit. So like if I, yesterday, yeah. I ended up having to process off the cre the grout because I didn't like the way it was looking with just the wet dry. So I went up to a 400 grit. So it wouldn't That's cut. Perfectly fine. And Something perfectly fine with my sealers. Yes. It'll bond well to that. Well, but then I did a heavy acid edge. So yeah. because I want to achieve, you know, excellent abrasion resistance in addition to excellent stain resistance and so i do an acid etch which jason johnston taught me how to uh to do a a, a better Brilliant. acid etch because yeah. frankly i was not very good at it and his method is is just amazing so i would love to um you know extend that knowledge to anybody who wants to know because jason really has has got a good a good thing going so um but all of that to say, the grouting took me and Jay 30 minutes, maybe. And it was rapid set. So two hours later, I had it honed off. And these, these pieces got sealed yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it was a, you know, flip over. And then we had a long weekend. So they sat. But I processed them, grouted them, and sealed them yesterday. Yeah. This is not a problem. And so all of that to say, um, you know, I think well, ninety eight percent on the pinholes is a is pretty darn good. When you start, and this is something when if you're you, not compromising if your strength. If you've been, if you've come to to class in the past two decades, almost, you've heard me say, embrace the pinholes, embrace your voids. Now, I'm not talking about huge, you know, craters that you can stick your fist in, or um, or even that you can stick your thumb in, right? thumb in, yeah, or a pencil eraser, right? Now, unless well, it's intentional, holes. like. Unless it's like the Buddy Rose hand press technique is an extremely deliberate. It gives you production and fabrication of voids. Right. Like that's part of the aesthetic. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, look, I just want to cast this. I want a really nice surface. And when you demold the piece, you go, ah, oh, I got some pinholes in it. Okay. No big deal. Right. People get their panties in a wad, excuse the expression, about. Oh, there's a pinhole at the end of the world. You know, now I got to do so much work. You know what? It's concrete. Concrete has pin. Show me a piece of concrete in the world that doesn't have a pinhole in it, right? That you're probably well, looking at something and that's again, photoshopped. And again, you know, I've done, you know, I've done concrete with mixed designs that claim to, you know, to be pinhole free and all of these things. And the reality is, th there's nothing that's perfect. You're always going to get something. Yeah. It might be on the underside, it might be in the edge, but it's going to be somewhere. And if you, you know, so if you're building melamine forms and you're casting a perfect piece every time and you're only acid etching, you might not reveal any, but I promise you, if you're trying to cast on a reusable table and you wet process, you will find a pinhole. And it does not matter what mix you use. And so you're going to have to, whether, you know, I know some people uh, that use like 10X after they seal for the one or two pinners they find, right? Uh, or, you know, I personally choose to grout. It takes me 30 minutes. It's not some major ordeal. Um, but I mean, I, I would say seven times out of 10, the top surface does not need grout in what I'm doing. So, you know, I maybe even eight or nine times out of 10, if that's what I'm going for. So I think, again, the capability of getting there is, is important, but we are not willing to compromise strength to get it. And Absolutely. that's the point we were making. And so in that vein, if you're cool with it, Jeff, I'll move on to fibers, PVA versus okay. AR. Are you cool with that? Yeah, sure. Because Great. that actually transitions into, uh, into strength. And this is an area that. So I've just I've marked always, the clip. It's certainly an area that I'm intimately familiar with because that's what I have a master's degree in, um, in trying to, tease out how do you what does strength mean <laughs> excuse me i got that cold you're you're just caleb's getting that cold i'm getting over the cold that that's the cost. so i went to dinner last me, night and you know, on the way home i'm like ooh, something 
strength is one of those <laughs> vague terms that people throw around that it's more of a a, a vague concept. Well, than, we're talking specifically like, about flexural strength. We're yeah, not talking so, about compressive so, strength. So I don't want to like get into a whole thing about it, but like we're talking about bending strength, like which is a combination of both compressive and tensile strength in a uniform material. So a piece of plywood, for instance, you don't measure the compressive strength of plywood. You don't measure the tensile strength of plywood. You measure the flexural, the bending strength of, it's just two different words for the same thing, because that's kind of how it's designed to be. If you're making a column to hold up a building, you don't measure its flexural strength because hopefully it doesn't bend, right? It's pure compressive compression getting squeezed so you want to know the compressive strength of it when you're building a um, reinforced concrete bridge that has steel in it the steel does a tension side of things the concrete adds a compressive strength the combination of those two as a composite speaking of composites here's my sophomore year of textbook it's compo mostly composites but steel ceramics polymers Tiny bit of concrete, but not really. <laughs> when you have two different materials, steel and reinforced steel embedded in reinforced com concrete, you have a composite. The composite's strength as a finished product has a flexural strength. But when you are selecting the individual materials, the concrete or the steel, you look at its individual material properties. And the individual material property of steel you're interested in is the tensile strength of the steel. Mm -hmm. For the concrete, because it's only really relied on in compression, you look at the compressive strength of the concrete. When you put them together, you get this. When you're making GFRC or ECC or UHCP, UHPC, as I said earlier, they are all cousins. They're all very close first cousins. It's the flexural strength because these are uniform materials. You don't have a discrete layer of steel in a particular location that operates where it, that one little discrete element of steel is taking all of the tensile strength and nothing else is. And then the concrete is taking compressive strength and no tensile strength, right? When we're mixing it all together in fiber we're making composites. We're, making a, we're trying to make a uniform material. Like mm -hmm. that's our goal is to make a uniform. It's not right, but it's tr we try to have it behave like a uniform material. And when you look at uniform materials, you look at the flexural strength. That's what's important. Right, it's a and very so difficult thing to measure. So I think you know one of the things that, and we were we were under this illusion as well. Uh, one of the common misconceptions is that because there are two <laughs> commonly used types of fibers in our in the craft concrete industry. PVA and uh, alkaline resistant glass. Mm -hmm. um, we heavily favor AR glass uh, because the common misconception is that they're kind of interchangeable and you're getting strength either way uh, and that's fine. Um, and and the, the reality, unfortunately, is that that is not the case. Uh, you know, I kind of want to debunk the misconception there because what we found in our testing is the data doesn't support it. We, you know, AR is far and away the stronger reinforcement material. Um, and you're just not going to get, you're not going to get that kind of strength out of PVA. Uh, it's going to behave a lot more brittly than, you, you it, can, than the material you, does with, with glass. So back in the, really in the, in the late 80s, early 90s in Japan, because they were, they were doing a lot of seismic development. And, P and ECC, Engineering Cementitious Composite, and PVA fibers, which are intimately related, were developed in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, uh, there's a professor in University of Michigan. I still haven't looked up his name. Um, <laughs> I think is uh, Lee, maybe. I can't remember. Um, helped develop and, and, and introduce ECC as a, as a seismic material. And it basic the basic principles are you have a very fine grain, high performance concrete, kind of like what we use now. 
Yes, it was uh, very it was... similar because a lot of what we use now is derived from from it. Um, and the reinforcing, the fiber reinforcing is, are the PVA fibers, and PVA stands for polyvinyl alcohol. And yes, it was Victor Lee was Victor the professor Lee, yeah. of civil yeah. and environmental engineering at the University of yeah. Michigan. Lots of great research papers Developed. you can find online. Yeah, engineered um, cementitious composites, also known as <laughs> ductile or bendable concrete. Yeah. So when you add enough of these fibers to a mix, and these fibers are highly tailored. In fact, in EC, in structural ECC, the, the fibers are actually oiled, believe it or not. So they don't bond to the concrete. They're meant to slip. Is what, what we want is we don't necessarily want a high peak strength. What we want is toughness. Toughness is the ability of a material to absorb energy. So it, imagine you have a piece of ceramic. You go to Home Depot, you buy a piece of ceramic tile, the cheap, you know, 50 cent little piece of three square. You hit that with a hammer. It shatters. So that 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 tile, if you wrap your fingers on it, you would say, wow, it's really hard, right? It's hard. Ceramic is hard, right? Is it strong? Well, define strength, because what's important to us, you, if, when you properly embed it in a, in a set of, you know, thin set on a, on a floor that's properly prepared, you can step on it, right? But if, if that tile's just laying on the floor and there's a rock underneath it and you step on that tile, it breaks. Is it strong? No, not really. You hit that tile with a hammer, it shatters. Well, the fact that you're hitting it with a hammer, A, you're putting a lot of dynamic energy into it. How well can that ceramic absorb the energy? It can't. It just shatters. It's brittle. It fractures. It's not a characteristic we want. As you add more and more fibers to that, you increase its ability to absorb energy. It might crack, but it's not going to fracture. And in seismic earthquake engineering, you want a building to be able to absorb that movement because that move, building's going to move. It's going to move. Right? It's going to shake. And yes, the building will be destroyed, but it won't fall down and kill people. That's, that's the important thing. Like in, in civil engineering design, we don't design things to, to not crack. We design things not to kill people. Right. Like you might have to tear the building down. No big deal. But nobody's going to die. They can get out. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. Right. So ECC, yes, it can bend. You see all these fancy pictures of concrete that's bendable. Con uh, concrete Decor did an article in 2009 about ECC or PVA fibers, I should say. And there's a very dramatic picture of this piece of concrete that's bending. It looks like a big watermelon slice after you eat all the watermelon, the rind that's left of this big smile. Right. Huge bending. What they don't show is on the tensile side of that, it's full of cracks. Right? It's full of cracks. The the implied the implication is that concrete bends like rubber and then it's still good. It's still flawless. It's not. And that's not the point. <laughs> what what PBA fibers help you do is instead of having one fracture point where you get like a split and then it just breaks in half. It distributes those cracks all throughout the bending zone. So it helps absorb that energy. It absorbs the deflection. The concrete still cracks. You look at it, your customer sees that and goes, oh, it's cracked. I don't want it, right? So a material that has that characteristic that is desirable for, say, earthquake engineering doesn't necessarily help us because to get that those characteristics mean our customers aren't going to like what we give them because if as we're moving it that concrete bends because it's going to right now it bends and cracks and flexes we've got cracks in it we got hairline cracks in it the customer sees it and go i don't want that redo it so how is that helping us um in order to be able to work with concrete and use fibers and I'm going to go off in the weeds here because it's important to understand why we like AR glass fibers and why we're not so keen on PVA fibers has nothing has less to do with the material of the fiber and more to do with the shape and the size of the fiber. So with like an ECC fibers, 
ACC, the f PVA fibers were very small. They're the eight millimeter, the Rec 15s. They're, I think, 18 micron or 10 micron diameter fibers. Very, very small, smaller than a human hair. Very, very fine. Um, great to work with. Well, great, great when you mix them in. Now you are going to get hairy concrete because you hone the surface; it gets stubbly. But with fibers, you've got all this surface area, and that's the thing that's not apparent, and that's not the thing that comes up in any kind of numbers or dosing. Is you've got a very light fiber, lightweight fiber. So PVA is about half the density of glass, a little less than half the density of glass. So a pound of PVA fibers obviously weighs the same as a pound of glass fibers. But there's a, physically a lot more stuff in a pound of PVA fibers than there are a pound of glass fibers. And we dose things by weight because it's easy, right? So if you weigh out a pound of PVA fibers, you're putting a ton more fibers into that concrete. And because they're so small and so sm such a fine diameter, they have a lot of surface area. And that surface area needs cement paste to coat it. And it need it takes up space in your concrete. And because these fibers are not little balls like sand grains, they're long, skinny things like chopsticks. They really interact mechanically. And the more fibers you stuff in your concrete, the more it affects the workability. And the more you can start to choke the mix. <coughs> So here's the danger of selecting the amount of fibers or the type of fibers you use based on how well it makes your it lets you make your concrete flowable if that's the goal. So if I want to make really pourable concrete, I can't use a lot of a very fine lightweight fiber because if I do, if I use the right amount, it's going to choke the mix and I can't make it pourable. So I have to back off on the amount of fibers to make it workable. I mean, anybody anywhere can test this out. Very simple. Make a bucket of concrete and start adding more fibers to it. And what happens at some point, all of a sudden you get a, a gritty hairball. Right. So with glass fibers, because they're a different aspect ratio, they're bundles. So you might have 200 filaments that are just as fine as a PVA fiber, but because they're bundled and they stay bundled, they act like one big thing. But structurally, because of the way, and again, glass fibers rely on polymer to help distribute the loads from inside to outside, because the polymer can penetrate that fiber bundle, but the cement grains can't. That polymer helps to distribute the loads from outside that fiber bundle to inside the fiber bundle. So now it structurally acts together. Whereas if you didn't have it, you you aren't getting those kind of strengths because there's nothing to transfer the loads. It's like open a box of spaghetti, take out a pack of dry spaghetti and make a bundle with it in your hands. You're only gripping the outside of those fibers or outside of those spaghetti bundles, the spaghetti, the pasta. The, if you if you pushed on it or pulled on it, rather, you're only pulling on the outside and it's only friction that's transferring the load to, to the inside. Well, if you pull hard enough, they're going to slip. If there's nothing connecting to the, the concrete to the inner core of the fibers, then you're not getting the kind of strength you expect because those inner core, the majority of the fibers, isn't doing any work. Only the outside is. And if you, so that's why GFRC relies on polymer in it because it helps to transfer the load from the outside to the inside of the fiber so they act together. And that because that polymer is slightly stretchy, it acts as a bungee cord, and the effect is you get a little little bit more elastic concrete. And that further comes back to why we like glass fibers. If you only have discrete individual monofilament fibers, a single PVA fiber or a single glass fiber that's a solid little bar, if you will, even though it's a little more flexible, all that surface area is exposed to the concrete. And you would think, wow, that's good. But it also means that every single fiber is affecting your paste and the workability. So if you have enough fibers to add to your strength, you're starting to choke the mix and it reduces the workability. Now, there's some tricks you can do by changing the proportions of the rest of the mix 
to accommodate that. But that mix has to be designed for that. You can't just take any mix and dump fibers into it. And typically, like with, with traditional ECC mixes, traditional as in the ones that are structurally designed by actual people who know what they're doing, there's more cement than sand in the mix. And the reason for that is fibers act like sand grains. They act as aggregate. They're a weird kind of odd-shaped aggregate, but they're chunks of stuff, just like a sand grain is a chunk of stuff. It takes up space. We rely on it to fill as structural elements. So you have to be cognizant of that. Um, so getting back to, to GFRC, the bundles have a lower surface area relative to their volume, but because they're not solid, they're individual fibers, we get the benefits of having a better transfer of all those fibers into the concrete. But the, the key that makes it work is the polymer that does it because the polymer can get inside where cement can't. So if you have a concrete mix that doesn't have polymer in it, it can't get into that bundle and it can't utilize all the fibers that you're putting in. The upside of all this is we have better workability with better strength by using a mix that takes all that into account, right. not just hand-waving, oh, we're making bendable concrete because somebody 20 years ago made something out of concrete that's nothing like what we want, nothing like what our uh, well, I, I had a, a shop manager a few years ago whose whose dad was kind of a um, general contractor, handyman kind of guy, and uh, and he used to and Jake used to say this a lot too. He was like, um, "There's nothing like the right tool, and this is nothing like it." And so I think it's very important that we have the right tool that's designed for the right thing because, you know, with Alpha, you know, Jeff has been really rigorous over the last what year year and change um in testing to a to, year and a half going on a year and a half to to give us so this isn't something we you know threw in a bag and said this will be good it it's been rigorously tested to prove to us that it not only gives you excellence exceptional beyond anything on the market right now strength but additionally Fantastic workability and flowability. I've one day flexural strengths that are better than some common bag mix twenty eight day strengths. Well, and we've gotten one again. day strength that are Not also one day strength. The the strength you'll get when you demold the hours. next day twenty four hours. And when I test, it's twenty four hour plus or minus like fifteen minutes. It's close. One day strength better than. 28 day strength of a competitor's product. Well, and, and, and additionally, we're getting one day strengths that are, I would say comparable to that of rapid set cemental. Yeah. So, you know, one day to one day, it's wild. So, you know, that's the kind of, and that'll be my, my plug on the, the alpha difference. Mm -hmm. So clap clip. Um, you know, because we've been testing these products before they go to market, you know, and, and now alpha's out. So if you want to buy it, um, yeah. or, and try it out, you know, drop us a line, let us know it's certainly available on the website. Um, you know, and, or, or if you call, call the office, Kim can take care of you. Um, but that's why we developed it. It's because we want the exceptional cast quality. We want the exceptional strength and we want that together. And yeah. so previous to this, that was not something you could get together. Um, and so we believe deeply in polymer, hence the use of it. Um, and we believe deeply in cast quality. So that's where this mix came from. And, you know, and so, uh, but we also have a deep commitment in making sure that our the material we teach you or the material we sell you is going to let you be successful and have the degree of confidence that, hey, I'm not going to make a piece and this time it breaks and that last time it didn't, but something was a little different or I go to demold this piece because I'm doing something a little bit bigger or something a little bit more challenging or or whatever, and all of a sudden it fails and you, you're out. You're out hundreds or thousands of dollars. Right. Because we assume strength when we make something out of concrete, right? We assume strength. And, and, you know, if we make a table and, and then, you know, tell somebody it can hold, you know, 
a bunch of weight and then you crack it on the bottom or whatever, you know, you're not, that's strength why always comes first strength has to come first. And that's why, you know, when we do these big events, which again, we're, we're working on uh, a big event for next year where we're going to do another engineered project because, you know, we want people to understand the power of taking strength into account above everything. Yeah. Right. And, and, but that doesn't mean we have to compromise surface quality. That's the beauty of it is we don't actually have to, we can give you your cake and you can eat it too. And that is the beauty of, you know, what I've seen with alpha that I I have not seen with any other mixed design I've used in my, you know, artisan business. Um, And, you know, the, this is the alpha range of products included, right? So that we're talking fluidizer, polymer and and certainly because the the um polymer contains a defoaming agent there's no need to add additional defoamer with you know use yeah, the, defo- polymer, the but... defoamer is there because some people still use a liquid polymer exactly so somebody else's polymer and uh that's what it's for mm-hmm. um but you know the current state of the, the 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 alpha line are the sort of the fundamental building blocks the next stage that i'm working on is is a a uh, an admixture that has the polymer in it of course um and uh, a combination of pozzolans that give me very very high early strength and very good fluidity and workability mm-hmm. a- and very good color consistency mm-hmm. um, that's because- something that i've seen too is we're getting unbelievable like color distrib- dis- uh, excuse me distribution um my colors are more vibrant uh, now that's that I've what started the polymer using... does for you. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, so that is, uh, I'm going to call that the alpha way. No more trade-offs. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't have to trade strength for, for beauty. Uh, you don't have to tr- trade fluidity or strength for fluidity. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I've been getting, I know, I know Jeff has as well, but I got a call yesterday from a gentleman out in California who bought some just to try it out. And he called me yesterday and he was like, man, I'm just calling you to tell you I've been doing some SEC with this stuff and I am just blown away by the strength and the surface quality. It's it's crazy and it's so much better than everything I've used. So um, we're grateful for that kind of feedback and, you know, it's starting to roll in now. And I think, you know, we're going to start to see that because it really is that good. And, you know, not just tooting CCI's horn or Jeff's horn or whatever, like that's what happens when you put strength and beauty together. That's what happens when you put strength as, you know, that's what happens when you actually take into account what your, what your customer needs and what they want. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, for CCI, what we, what our customers want is beauty. What they need is strength. And so we've taken both into account. And what we don't want is to decide what you want for you. We want right. you to be able to do multiple different finishes if we only with the same on mix one, design. Like, I, I could give you concrete that is unbelievably strong, like just mind blowingly strong, but you would hate working with it. And it probably would be ugly. Right. And what good is that? It's like that sealer that I tested 20 years ago that was, you know, bulletproof but ugly. Bulletproof but ugly, you know, clear truck bed liner with that lovely texture. What good is it? Nobody wants that. Mm-hmm. So the flip side is are you going to settle for a mix that promises plastic perfection, but you have no idea how strong it really is? Like, well, you can rest assured that if if you're being told to put less than two and a half percent fibers or or less than two yeah. percent fibers into your mix, you can rest assured that it is not as strong as you think it is. Yeah, concrete. As you take away the fibers, it becomes more and more brittle. Right, that the fibers are what give it the 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 ability to absorb that energy. Bending is energy. Mm-hmm. So if you pick up a long piece, I'm going to get my prop up here. You know, you're casting that slab. That that it's big, you know, that kitchen island. I got my my ruler right. If you pick it up, or one of your workers picks it up, and then you're not thinking about what's happening, you should be picking it up like this. But at some point, you know, they pick it up this way. As that bends, right, 
what does what do I need? I need flex. I need bending strength to resist this, because if that piece doesn't have good bending strength, if it can't tolerate bending, if it's brittle, it fractures. Mm -hmm. So doesn't matter how pretty it is. And as you drop fibers, you lose toughness. Like I've actually tested the same mix, the same identical mix with PVA fibers, and glass fibers, and no fibers. And the when when concrete cracks because it's a it's a composite, right? You've got the the cement matrix, which binds all the sand grains together, binds all the fibers together. The cement matrix that is you got your initial crack. That when you when you see a hairline crack, what you're seeing is the matrix cracking, and that's the mix design. And then when you see uh, a crack open up but not actually become two pieces. Like your concrete, the crack opens up. Now you're relying on the fibers. So as I said, with like ECC, you're gonna, when that, that piece bends, if it bends like that, you're looking at the underside, right? So I'm gonna flip it over. You're gonna see like hundreds of little hairline cracks all along this bending zone where it's high, high bending strength, high bending stress, I should say. Okay. All those little hairline cracks are still defects to the customer, but your piece is staying together. Right. And one of the characteristics of, of ECC that made it revolutionary is it's behaving more like a metal. So a metal like uh, steel, when you bend it and you actually put a bend, physical bend in it, it work hardens. So it gets stronger, but it gets more brittle. So there's a point where, like, if you took a piece of steel and you bent it back and forth, you're fatiguing it. Every time you bend it, it gets a little stiffer. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean flexing it like this. I mean, actually putting a kink in it where it stays. <laughs> Ultimately, it's going from a ductile material to a brittle material. And when it hits that brittle stage, it fails. Mm -hmm. Cast iron is a brittle material. You can't bend it much before it fractures. Unreinforced concrete is a brittle material. It can only bend a tiny, tiny amount. And then when it bends too much, it fractures and there's nothing to stop that fracture, nothing to hold it together, nothing to absorb that energy. It just fails. If you don't have enough fibers in your mix, the same thing happens. So if you're using a fiber that, if you use it in the right amount and it chokes your mix so you can't pour it, you cut back on the fibers. Well, if you cut back on those fibers to make it pourable, you could actually be making a brittle material to where you're handling it and there's no warning and all of a sudden bam it snaps now you got two pieces of concrete right and we've seen this you know i've seen mm -hmm. where you know you're flipping it and it falls off the you know maybe you've got one of those grip grappler grappler things for your forklift mm -hmm. and it slips and it hits the floor and it sh shatters right or you're yeah. you're leaning it down over the cabinetry and it just goes kink in i mean yeah that's a problem and that's a remake and that's not a handling failure. I mean, the it's dropping is failure. obviously, but the, the, you know, if you're laying it down onto cabinetry and you've got it, like it's got to be able to go from vertical to semi horizontal and then get slid onto the countertop without cracking or breaking. And so that is a brittle failure that using the proper reinforcement could, could, could save you from, um, so I think with that, Jeff, we actually did do almost an hour and a half. So, yep. uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to clap, mark this clip uh, and go into, um, so just really quick, um, you know, if you're interested in checking out our materials, they are available on our website in the shop section. Um, you know, certainly check out Alpha Polymer, Fluidizer, Defomer, the whole nine yards. Uh, be on the lookout for, um, you know, some blended products in the in the nearish future. I don't have dates for that, obviously, yet, uh, but when we do, we'll announce them. Uh, and then if you'd like to see some of these products in action, um, both in a from scratch and in a, a cemental based mix, because as we've mentioned in previous podcasts, that actually... Um, We've we've produced pretty phenomenal strength gains in cemental by using mm -hmm. alpha polymer. So if you'd like to see alpha in action, um, learn how to use it. Learn how to use it. Understand the the ratios that I'm using versus the ratios Jeff's using with different mixers and how those things play well together. 
um, and the type of quality that you get. Uh, we have a class November 9th and 10th, GFRC Mastery. Um, this is your, you know, I'm not going to call it bare bones. It's very comprehensive, but it's the just concrete class. We're not going into business or anything like that. We're making some cool projects out of concrete. It's two days. Um, and it's not a sales pitch either. No, it's point you no, it's not. I mean, you have, you will happen to use those products. And so if that's something you're after, that would be a great opportunity for that. But the reality is what it is, is teaching you how to make GFRC, um, well, uh, and then, Subsequent to that, we've got, um, and we've had this planned for, I think announced it several months ago, um, the December 4th through 8th Ultimate cl uh, Course. Um, again, both of these are at my studio in Canton, North Carolina, just west of Asheville. Um, and uh, and again, we announced the December class months ago. Um, so we've already gotten some buzz there, already got a few attendees. We're really excited about that class filling up quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, just be aware that there are limited seats available and jump on both of those. If you'd like to come see us in person, um, see alpha in person. Um, and, and the ultimate class is business as well. So if you want to learn how to do this as a business, yeah, that is, there's no, no better place than the ultimate it's really course. comprehensive. Um, it's not just, Hey, here's, here's a couple finishing techniques, finishing techniques and, and some, it's not, it's not a cooking show where things are like half done and then, or rush through or one person. Yeah. You don't, you don't stand around with your hands in your pockets watching somebody else do it. Right. We we're make actually you going to be, <laughs> we're actually we doing stand around with our hands in our pockets. Right? No, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, we do a lot of, you know, explaining and we do want you to do that work, um, you know, and learn how to do it for yourself. We want to teach you to fish. We don't want to give you fish. So, um, you know, in, in November, we've got a number of projects lined up and I, I have them somewhere in my head, but my head cold is stopping. We're going to do some really cool stuff. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. Uh, and then in December, we're doing a big fireplace surround and it's a real project. So just, um, you know, be excited about that. Join us. Um, we want to see you, mm -hmm. um, in person. And hey, you can come see that awesome table we made in, um, in May at the Legends yeah. event. Which is um, still crack free. And it sure will is. always be crack free. It sure will. Uh, 16 feet long, double cantilever, two eight foot cantilevers, six inch wide base. 2,000 uh, pound end load. Cable stayed, 2,000 pound safe end load. Yes. No um, guessing there. No. You don't have to wave your hands and guess and say, ah, it's not really that important. It is important. It's very important. And very important. It, and, and it's successful. So. Uh, join us for that. And with that, I will let you go. We will let you go and we'll see you next week on episode 24. So thanks Looking for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye folks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the maker in the mix podcast. If you liked the content and want to hear more, please like, and subscribe. Uh, feel free to follow us on YouTube as well as Instagram, Facebook, and check out the website, www.concretecountertopinstitute.com. And of course, we'd love to see you at one of our upcoming classes. Tune in next week for more informative content. Thanks.